I would say that clearly the biggest risk of pure nicotine, and now I'm just talking about it through the lens of synthetically acquired nicotine, so you're getting rid of all the tobacco related processing, is uh, in its addictive nature. And make no mistake about it, nicotine is highly addictive. Um, there are some other areas where depending on the dose, there may actually be a harm. Again, I think this is very important to understand. Um, there are some mechanistic insights that suggest a negative uh, impact on the endothelium. And it's certainly plausible that anything that negatively impacts the endothelium could increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, but um, these are not studies that have been, you know, these are not large studies. These are not studies that have been done in humans. And these are extrapolations typically from other animal uh, uh, models. So, um, let, I guess we should probably just maybe spend a minute kind of talking about nicotine again. Um, and again, I go into, if people want more detail on this, I think it's covered four years ago, but um, nicotine uh, activates, so nicotine is a molecule and it activates something called the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Now, these receptors are not just in the brain where we most frequently talk about them, but they can actually exist throughout the body. And if you look at certain mouse models and rodent models, such as other rodents like, like rats, um, it's been demonstrated that high doses of nicotine can actually increase tumor growth and even foster metastases, um, in addition to increasing atherosclerotic plaques. Now, uh, that sounds you know pretty devastating. Um, I, I just want to always point out when it, whenever we're talking about these rodent models, um, there there are you know there there's lots of daylight typically between what happens in that model and what happens in in humans, um, and I, I think it's important to kind of look at um, uh, other ways to triangulate upon the answer. So we're, we'll link to those studies in the show notes, um, but the closest thing that we could find in um, in humans was a 2024 Mendelian randomization. I know we talk about these a lot, but I always think it's worth explaining what an MR is. So a Mendelian randomization says, let's look at um, genes in the population, which we can assume are randomly assorted. That's the randomization part. And let's ask the question, will these genes be a proxy for a behavior that I want to study or something that I want to study where I can now use effectively observational tools to see if there's a difference. So again, you know, one example is um, Mendelian randomization consistently shows that LDL cholesterol is causally associated with heart disease. Why? Because LDL cholesterol is highly genetic and you can look across a population and see different levels of LDL, even in people who are, you know, otherwise healthy, and you can examine the cardiovascular outcomes of these people, which would be the dependent variable. Um, and that's how you could infer causality. By extension, by the way, HDL cholesterol turns out to be not causally related in the inverse. Nevertheless, so if you look at this Mendelian randomization, they wanted to look at the relationship of nicotine by itself on compromised lung function, lung cancer, COPD, CH, um, ASCBD, et cetera. Okay. So, um, the only, so, so I want to be clear. I don't think this was the world's best, um, MR. I think it was clever though. So what did they look at? Cause like what genes would you try to parse out to understand how much tobacco someone is consuming, which is what you actually want to be able to do. So what they looked at was they looked at genes that spoke to nicotine metabolism. And so just as caffeine, we've talked about this in the past, caffeine uh, metabolism is highly genetic, right? So people like me are wickedly fast at metabolizing caffeine. Um, and therefore I seem to be able to drink it later in the day without a negative impact. Um, someone who's a very slow metabolizer is going to feel it more. Well, similarly with nicotine, you have high and low levels of nicotine um, metabolism. And what the authors of this study uh, postulated was people who are um, faster nicotine metabolizers are going to have lower levels of circulating nicotine and therefore less nicotine exposure. Now, 
that's possible. I, I, technically, you could also argue that maybe someone who's a faster nicotine metabolizer would smoke more or consume more nicotine. So again, put that aside for the moment. But nevertheless, uh, the authors used these genetic variants associated with nicotine metabolism to adjust for basically smoking heaviness. And again, we're not interested in the role of smoking. We're interested in the role of nicotine. Okay. So um, disease risk was increased with slower nicotine metabolism, but the added risk was abolished when adjusted for smoking heaviness. Because of course, if you do this, you have to adjust for smoking, indicating that the main drivers of the outcomes um, are the non-nicotinic components of cigarette smoke. Let me state that again. This is a complicated MR, but it's the closest thing I think we have to looking at humans. And it's looking at how much people smoked, how quickly they metabolize nicotine, trying to do an overlay of that to, to, to appreciate the nicotine exposure. And it came away basically saying that the harm of smoking is due to the tobacco and tobacco related products, not due to the nicotine. I want to be clear, this is way, way far away from what you would want to be able to say is level one evidence, right? If you wanted to do this in a level one fashion, you would actually have to randomize people to a whole bunch of different tobacco-free nicotine products and study the outcomes of interest. Now, of course, nobody's going to do that for hard outcomes like mortality, uh, but I certainly think people could do that for softer outcomes. Um, uh, and, and, and my hope is that, that somewhere along there, people, people do that. Thank you.